Ladies and gentlemen, we might get underway, if that's okay. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Caitlin Byrne. I'm the director of the Griffith Asia Institute, and it is a great pleasure to welcome you here this evening for one of our climate action conversations. Uh, this is our very own curtain raiser to the state of origin, so let me congratulate you all. You're in the right place for tonight. Um, now, in the spirit of reconciliation too, if I can firstly acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting this evening, the Turrbal and Jagera peoples. And I pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all First Nations peoples, including those joining us this evening. So this event tonight is brought to you by the Griffith University Climate Action Beacon and is done is in partnership with the British High Commission of Australia. And I do have a couple of acknowledgements to make, in particular for those of you in the audience, uh, Miss Joanne Freeman, Consul General of the United Kingdom for Australia and Northern Territory. Fabulous to have you here. Also, Professor Carolyn Evans, Vice Chancellor and President of Griffith University. Mr. Mark Donovan, Senior Business Relationship Manager, Department for International Trade of the United Kingdom. Ms. Emma Vowetti, I'm not sure if Emma's here yet, but we most likely will see her. Apologies from Emma, but clearly we have others from uh, the Pacific Islands Council of Queensland, and really fantastic to have you here, thank you. Also, Ms. Irene Chow, uh, President of Pacifica Women's Alliance. Ms. Lynette Wessel, from the President of the PNG Federation of Queensland, and we have a number of people in the audience. I won't be calling all of your names out, but you're all distinguished and you're all welcome here this evening. This event is, as I mentioned, brought to you by Griffith University's Climate Action Beacon. And that is a five-year interdisciplinary research and cross-sectoral practice collaboration program that really aims to develop the knowledge, leaders, leadership, capacity and responses that will enable effective and just action in response to climate change throughout our society. We're particularly delighted to be partnering this evening with the British High Commission. And I think in many ways that is a reflection of the UK's global leadership on climate action, particularly this year. And it's something that we'll be hearing more about over the next coming days as the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson hosts the, lead, the meeting of G7 leaders in Cornwall. And of course, that is also in the lead up to the UK's hosting of the UK, UN Climate Change Conference, COP26, in Glasgow later this year. While these events are particularly significant for those of us interested in diplomacy and, and global uh, conversations, we're mindful too of the need to bring voices and experiences of those closer to home um, to the fore, particularly if we are to build and sustain inclusive conversations about climate change and what climate action means for each of us. And, and it's particularly important as we think about that road to COP26. Tonight in particular, in the fashion of global climate justice champion, Mary Robinson, we want to focus on the voice, the voices, the experiences and the leadership offered by women and in particular, Queensland women. So I think we'll be bringing to you a really vibrant discussion that will be slightly uh, a little different to many of the climate conversations that we've been hearing of late. And to formally open tonight's event, I wonder if I can invite Auntie Win Takani to come to the podium and deliver an opening prayer. Good evening. As, a, as we gather here to develop and create sustaining and inclusive climate conversations on the road to COP26, we each turn to our own creator, the one whose design and influence put our planet on its path, and we give thanks for being brought together safely. Let us pray. We ask for protection and support for those presently suffering from the incursions of changing weather patterns, and ask for blessings on our leaders so minds can be open to new thought and new ways of being, and we can work together to bring much needed change. 
We ask for blessings over our conversations, that we may work in unity, cooperation and mutual respect, and reach resolution needed to carry us forward into a better future. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Auntie Wintercarney. If I can now also invite the British Consul General to Queensland and the Northern Territory to deliver some opening remarks. Joe Freeman, the podium is yours. Thank you. Um, so, hi everybody, my name is Jo Freeman. Um, I think that's the third time I've said that now today. Uh, I'm Consul General for Queensland and the Northern Territory, and I too would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects and tribute to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, the British Consulate General of the High Commission in Canberra, we are delighted to partner with Griffith University on such an important and meaningful event. It's fantastic to see such a broad cross-section of Brisbane community engaged in this issue, and it is a hugely important issue. As you know, the UK will be president of COP26 in November, and we are committed to delivering an ambitious, inclusive COP that upholds the terms of the Paris Agreement and delivers for everyone. Under our COP26 presidency, the UK is committed to delivering an ambitious outcome that puts the world on a path to achieving our Paris goals. And our approach has four distinct pillars which I'd like to share with you now. The first is mitigation. We're encouraging all actors to come forward with a net zero target by 2050 or sooner and to set strong interim emissions reduction targets. In fact, the UK was the first developed country to legislate a net zero target in 2019 and recently update our 2030 target to 68% below 1990 levels by 2050. I'm pleased to say that we're officially halfway to our net zero target, with emissions recently reaching 50% below 1990 levels. And I think recently the UK hasn't got a lot of things right, but on this thing I think we are right on track. Um, second, adaptation. We want to ensure that all actors have sufficient resources to develop and implement credible strategies to adapt to the destructive impact of climate change. These impacts are here now, we're living through them, and Australia's neighbours in the region are some of the most vulnerable to these impacts. We're certainly no strangers to natural disasters here in Queensland, but we need to brace for increased severity and frequency in the future. And the UK is advocating for plans and finance to be in place to build defences, early warning systems and resilient infrastructure to avoid the loss of life, livelihoods and natural habitats. The third thing that we are focusing on is finance. Where's the money coming from? So we want to ensure that there are enough financial resources for climate action. The UK has committed to doubling its international climate finance to £11.6 billion between 2021 to 2025. We want to ensure that every financial decision made takes climate change into account so we can raise resources for climate action and safeguard the resilience of investments. And the fourth pillar is our international collaboration. By working together, we can accelerate the transition to global net zero at the pace required. With focused collaboration across governments, business and civil society, we can make real progress in the largest emitting sectors of power, road transport and land use. Collaboration will enable us to innovate faster, create stronger incentives for investment and drive down costs for low carbon alternatives through the global mechanisms laid out in the Paris Agreement. We have committed to hosting an inclusive, ambitious COP. At the forefront of this is to secure science-based targets committing to net zero by 2050 and joining the race to zero a global campaign to rally leadership and support from business, cities, regions, investors and universities. Inclusivity is central to our COP plans, both in how we engage and also how we can facilitate more inclusive climate action in the future. And this means demonstrating that we have provided space for marginalised groups, experts and activists to ex express their priorities and amplify their voices. Existing inequalities exacerbate the impacts of climate change for individuals and communities, limiting their resilience whilst constraining their options to act. This includes, but isn't limited, to those living in poverty, 
women and girls in particular, people with disabilities, youth, indigenous and marginalized groups, and those facing multiple exclusions based on intersectional characteristics. Diverse communities should be seen as agents of change and their knowledge and leadership is necessary to deliver effective global and local solutions. So the UK is fully committed to implementing and facilitating the implementation of the Gender Action Plan agreed at COP25, both domestically and internationally. We welcome the steps taken so far by parties, non-party stakeholders and the UNFCCC Secretariat to deliver on the enhanced UNFCCC Gender Action Plan and, gender, and centre gender equality in climate action. And we're continuing to call on all countries to develop gender responsive climate policies, plans, strategies and actions. The UK also recognises that the meaningful participation of Indigenous peoples, their knowledge and leadership is absolutely vital to the acceleration of climate action. As stewards of 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity, Indigenous peoples lead the way in nature-based, resilient and effective solutions to climate change through their knowledge and innovations, technologies and spiritual values. And in fact, I was lucky enough to be in Hopevale um, up in North Queensland uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I'm returning there this week, to meet with some of the elders um, and to hear firsthand some of the programs and the action plans that they're putting into place, not just for the wider community, but for their young people coming through and their emerging young leaders, teaching them the importance of climate change and it was so fantastic and inspiring to see that in action. And we're hoping to continue that across, across wider Australia. The UK is committed to championing the participation and meaningful engagement of Indigenous peoples through COP26. And we're cl working closely with the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change and the UNFCCC Local Communities and Indigenous Peoples Platform, which is, I'm sure, easier to action than it is for me to say. Um, Young people and their voice around the world is equally a powerful catalyst for change. I think this is evidenced by the extraordinary school strike for climate marches that we have witnessed again recently. We are working in partnership with the Italian government who will host the pre-COP and youth event in Milan. And the youth event brings together 400 delegates to discuss a number of topics with a final declaration committed to COP26. Um, we are also working with Italy to deliver a Youth for Climate webinar series to galvanise ambition and insight from young people ahead of the Youth COP and Feed into COP itself. And it's so inspiring when you hear and you see those young people coming together. Um, they are the future and they are the ones that are kind of leading the charge for change. And I kind of am always inspired by hearing them, uh, watching them in action. And I think that it's something that uh, we're going to take forward. Go and, and Things like COP and COP26 give us a real platform for those young people to embrace this. So in closing, I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this event and represent the British High Commissioner, the British High Commission and the UK. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the views of this fantastic panel that we've got together. And who cares about the state of origin? This room is the place to be this evening. So thank you very much indeed. Thanks so much, Jo, and I think you're absolutely right. Who cares about the state of origin? Uh, you're also right that climate change demands leadership, climate action demands leadership. We're really grateful for the leadership provided by the British High Commission and the UK more broadly on this particular issue. And we're really delighted to have our leaders who are going to be coming up on the panel, people that are with us in our community and lead in very many diverse ways on these particular issues. So let me invite our panellists to take their chairs and while you take your seats, I'll introduce you. Does that sound all right? I'm going to introduce you first, Stefan. So if you'd like to come up, Stefan will be leading the conversation this evening. Stefan is an SBS News correspondent for Queensland and the Pacific and an industry fellow with the Griffith Asia Institute. And Stefan will be joined by Dr Bianca Beetson, who is Kabi Kabi and Wurudjuri woman and the director of the Indigenous Research uh, Centre here at Griffith University. We will also have Maureen Mopio, a Papua New Guinean journalist and presenter for Radio 4EB. And finally, Ms Georgine Rudenries. Georgine is the Executive Director for the Climate Change and Sustainable Futures. 
I'm not sure where that goes, unit, I think, <laughs> at the Queensland Government Department of Environment and Science. So friends and colleagues, please join me in welcoming our panellists. And Stefan, over to you. Thank you very much, Caitlin. And thank you very much for coming. Yes, we'll try to keep it on time for those of you that desperately do need to go later. Um, we'll go straight into the conversation. We haven't got much time to, uh, to have this chat before we throw it to the floor for questions. So just keep, keep, keep in mind what you want to ask. At the end, we'll get you to go to the microphones in each corner and um, you can ask these three excellent panellists um, your thoughts. I'd like to start first with, with Bianca here. Bianca is um, obviously a First Nations person. So First Nations First Voice policy. Um, Bianca, climate change, your, your people have been in this country longer than anyone, uh, 60, 70,000 years, possibly longer. Um, could you explain, first of all, in your art practice and in your cultural practice, how has climate change affected you and, and your people? And how are you communicating that, that message of how, how you've been affected? I mean, you know, there's, there's lots of examples I can give, but, um, you know, also, as an arts educator, you know, I've spent a lot of time talking about um, how we can look at sustainability in our practice as well, you know. So there's lots of different things. So, there's, so I could start off thinking about sustainability in our practice and how do we as first people be mindful of how the artwork we create, given that we create more art for Western, you know, walls these days, um, and even right down to, you know, moving them, shipping them, all these kinds of things, how do we make sure a lot of our practices to stay well, it's not harming the, the environment, um, but there's also really key cultural practices that are actually being wiped out, you know, um, and we start adapting and finding other ways to be able to continue this cultural, you know, have a cultural continuum and looking at things, for instance, you know, I've got this PhD student that I'm working with, he's a Palawa man, He's working with the Tasmanian women shellers who do the beautiful necklaces. And there's real evidence between um, the climate change and, and the re reduction of the shells, but also a lot of them are very brittle and they're, they're forming. So there's been a partnership between the Griffith School of Dentistry and himself, and he's a jeweler, and he's actually working to get um, these 3D printed versions of the shells that can be used, and then the, then, then the women will be able to go and string the shells, so because so that they'll be able to continue that practice. Um, and they're working with scientists, scientists to try and find um, filaments that you know mimic the um, mimic the, the shell and come as close as possible. So, you know, there's there's many ways we're looking at it. I'm um, I've been was involved in a uh, forum two years ago in Melbourne where. I had to address all the arts leaders and the arts minister and the shadow minister for the arts. And I actually sort of put a call out saying, we actually need to have a climate action policy um, in, all, uh, you know, as a, as in all our arts policies. It's really important because what we need to be looking at is um, you know, thinking about the refugees in our country. And I think about our Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters and how soon, you know, when their island sinks, they're not going to be able to um, practice their cultural practice. They're not going to have anywhere where they can do perform their cultural ceremonies. And of course, with native title laws, it makes it very problematic to perform and do your own cultural ceremony on, on, on the mainland. And same way when you know, we had the fires, you know, our cultural heritage was being burned in front of us. You know, these, these sacred trees and these places that we use and inform our practice that, that we work with. You know, Carnarvon Gorge, you know, we had the, the major burnings of some of the, the, the footpath that caused the rock, rock art to be destructed. That is our cultural heritage, our cultural knowledge and what informs our practice. And when that's gone, you know, it, it impacts the future generations. Um, not just, you know, the, the current generation of artists and, and cultural practitioners. And how are you conveying that message to the people who might be able to influence policy? Is Do, do you think there's a, a way of letting them know that through your art practice? Look, I, I think um, the more and more we um, highlight artists that are working in this space, because you know, we know artists are really good, you know, really good at communicating some of the broader issues and, and translating a lot of the, the scientific and cultural knowledge um, into forms that not only, it's not about just educating, you know, the the, the hierarchy, the, the high level um, politicians, it's also about educating the public. So when people start to see, you know, the, the impact of these beautiful objects and, you know, people start seeing that, you know, this dance can't be done anymore because that site's destroyed or whatever, um, only then do people start to actually 
get a real understanding that this is actually about place and location and and when that when those places those sacred sites and those songs are gone you know so um so there's a, so, so that's through exhibiting through projects through um every opportunity i get to speak i do try and you know raise the issues um and also i'm working on a small research project at the moment as part of the climate action beacon and that's going to be looking at how do we tell those stories of the impacts on artists and, and cultural practitioners around, um, you know, cli what well, climate action's done, but also the adaption that they're having to do as well. Mm, just one more question. Your, your culture has had connection to country here for all, all those tens of thousands of years. Uh, and obviously there's been a, a huge influx of migrants or immigrants in the last 230, 240 years. Do you think there's, um, because of a lot of those people's lack of connection to country, there's a, a, a lack of understanding about how climate change is impacting Australia? I mean, for me, it spans around, or it's centred around this, the words custodianship. Because if we take on this idea of custodianship in everything we do, it changes this idea of ownership and, you know, that's the, the debate, you know, Western society is about ownership, we own this land, this is our land, we can do what the hell we want to it. But when you think about custodianship and this, this land is, is, our, is our mother and you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't remove the resources, dig holes and, and destroy your mother and throw rubbish on your mother. So if you t look at it from that perspective um, and, and we start thinking about we can all be custodians of this planet, and thinking about how do you nurture and love the, the planet, we can bring a change. And I think that's, it's about changing that language from ownership to custodianship. Excellent, thank you. And that's where I'd like to go to Maureen. Maureen's uh, from Papua New Guinea, obviously. She's done uh, a lot of work in the media and talks to a lot of other Pacific Islanders. And the Pacific Islanders have uh, collectively uh, signed a declaration uh, called the Boy Declaration, which recognises climate change as the greatest existential threat to the region. And it affects all the different nations in different ways and different areas of the nations in different ways. Warren, could you just t tell us a little bit about, uh, from, from your contact with the Pacific Islander community, um, what, what's, the, what's their feelings about uh, what's happening to, to their nations out from here, out from Australia? I'll represent, I'm a matriarch of my family and I represent about 5,000 people from my family and uh, relatives in, in Ivia, Makeo, in the central province of Papua New Guinea. And the, my family have been affected by floods, um, heavy rains since 2016 up till 2020 now. And I support them continuously. So I may not be the only one supporting them as well. I may be the only one amongst other Pacific Islanders who support their people back at home in terms of uh, other financial support or resort support and um it, 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 is it, Queensland has the largest Pacific Islander diaspora of any state in Australia so this is really Queensland is really the gateway to the Pacific in, there in is uh, the Pacific Islands reference group send a representative to COP23 and also uh, they organized a uh, uh, event where they had key speakers who mm. came over to Queensland to talk on uh, climate change and recently they organized a virtual meeting, meeting mm -hmm. amongst the other Pacific uh, leaders and le uh, church leaders to talk about climate change and the impact it was having on the people as well. So um, it is a big diaspora, Pacific Island diaspora here and uh, like going back to my family I uh, created the documentary No Land, No Livelihood, No Home because my brother was displaced and I called it that documentary and I spoke to, looked at the different impacts of women as well and uh, spoke to people in Fiji. Um, they have a weather watch uh, center in Fiji where they um, look at women as first respondents to humanitarian crisis. And uh, so I also spoke to some of the ladies that came over for the uh, climate change uh, microfinance programs and projects here in Australia. And they passed through Queensland, which was done through um, Friends of the Earth as well. 
So um, I interviewed some of the ladies from Oro province, which is mainland in, in Papua New Guinea, and Tongan lady who said that the islands were sinking and, and mm -hmm. that, yeah. And is that putting pressure on the community? Does the community feel like they have to, through remittances or in other means, try to support their communities back home, which are, which are having, losing of, their uh, livelihoods? The people I spoke to in 350 Pacific Climate Warriors, their representatives, uh, youth representatives, they help their own people back there. Like even uh, one of the ladies who works with Pacific uh, Climate uh, um, pa Calling Partnership in Sydney, uh, sends back support to her Kiribati home. So she was also featured in one of the programs, uh, one of the episodes of the document, radio documentary that I did on no land, no livelihood, no home. And uh, yes, it does apply pressure a bit uh, on people living here, but I guess it's the family ties and the family heritage that is important to the people back at home that connects the uh, family yeah. And through the work that you're doing, do you think, and, and, other, and other journalists, or generally through communication, do you think the, an Australian audience is really hearing the message from what's happening in the Pacific? Um, I don't think so. There's, um, because in 2015, the Pacific Islands Reference Group at that time organised a rally. Um, and um, so it, it has been going on quite a long time, there were sea levels rising and everything, but uh, a lot of audience, oh, our people in Australia don't seem to understand, not so much understand, but look at uh, what is happening back at uh, the uh, islands. And the islands themselves, who are representative here as well as back home, are making a lot of noise and it's beginning to gather momentum as well. And uh, I guess, one of the interviews I did with Sister Wendy Flannery said that uh, she's hopeful that uh, what's happening in the Pacific region is, um, is people are resilient, they're doing their own advocacy, like the, the Cataract Islanders in Bougainville who were displaced mm -hmm. to the, in 2009. They saw the island split into half and she's done a lot of advocacy and she gets a lot of support through uh, We're Friends of the Earth. And um, she, um, they've relocated to the mainland Tinputs area, and of course that comes with its other problems of uh, language as well, and yeah. and that, yeah. Okay, thank you, Maureen. Um, Georgine, to you, you, you out of out of the three panelists here, you've got the job that's sort of probably hardest to comprehend in a way. Um, an artist. A, a journalist and you're a policy maker and, <laughs> and you're here, you're here, <laughs> and you're here, you're here now with a First Nations woman from Australia, uh, from a representative from one of the really large diasporas in Queensland. Mm. Um, how do their voices feed into, or oh, can you explain what, what do you do? Uh, Let's start with that. <laughs> I'll start with what I do and, and then I guess um, it, it may go some way to, to explain um, the difficulty of, of voices coming forward. Um, so I sit in the Department of Environment and Science. It is one department of many uh, within the Queensland Government and in the hierarchy it sits uh, quite low on the, um, on the rungs of, of important government departments. Uh, we are solely responsible for climate change action in this state. Um, and I guess for some time now we have been struggling um, to have the influence that we need to have to, to get the sort of response that, that you would need um, from a state like Queensland, uh, which is the highest emitting state uh, in the country. Um, but slowly, uh, and, and nonetheless, and, and I guess as we continue to move through COPs, as the, um, the actual impacts of climate change are being felt um, every day and by everyday Australians. Um, the bushfires were a, a fairly significant turning point, I think, for the conversation in the country. You are starting to see um, the, the rest of government stand up and, and, and at the end of the day, that is what is required. Uh, if all departments um, and all sectors are thinking about the issue and, and thinking about the issue for their stakeholders, then, uh, you, you have more ability to, to hear far more stakeholders in that conversation. Um, 
certainly from the Department of Environment Science perspective, we 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 were fortunate uh, last term to have a minister who was actually First Nations, um, Leanne Enoch, and that enabled us. That changed the conversation very much for us because she she was really able to lead that conversation with the community. Um, and was, was, I guess, gave us a licence to, to participate uh, far more adequately in that conversation, I suppose, um, because it, you know, there, there's often a nervousness um, from, from policymakers who don't have a large First, Repre First Nations representation in, in their work groups to start, I guess, um, developing a policy position or a conversation with First Nations that hasn't been developed by First Nations for First Nations, if, if that makes sense. But having a First Nations minister um, gave us a, a very different uh, ability to engage in that conversation because we had somebody who, who could really instruct us on, on how to bring that conversation forward. Uh, and so in that time, I, I think we were far more successful. We, we held a First Nations Climate Leadership Summit uh, in Queensland in 2019 during Climate Week and use all the levers of government to respond to, to climate change. So whether that's the operations of government and government owns all the hospitals and the schools and the, um, the road infrastructure and, and what have you, all of those things from an operational perspective need to be decarbonised. Uh, and from a policy perspective, um, there is um, taking into account climate change and climate risk information in all decision making, whether that's health policy or whether that's education policy, whether it's the way that Treasury is allocating money, um, whether it is uh, the types of industry that the Department of State Development is, is attracting to the state. It's considering issues of, around, um, you know, what do we do considering that most of our uh, state's wealth is derived from fossil fuel um, heavy industries. It, that's what we do with that information. It is to try and influence our government policy across the board and then to build capability within the community. We also run a, a number of programs and, and, and we also provide the science. So, you know, we, we have a big science capability. We, we try and get that into decision making. We host programs that build capability in local government and state governments and the community to sort of try and integrate and manage these issues. Effectively, my job will be done when every uh, decision by every decision maker in Queensland is taking climate change into account. And because it will be every one of those decisions that will make the difference for um, whether we are effective in managing this risk. And is that what the Queensland Climate Plan is? So the Queensland Climate Action Plan, uh, which, uh, which my branch has responsibility for developing, is, is really trying to say at a macro level, um, what is it that we um, will have to do over the next 10 years to meet our targets? So we have a 30% below, uh, below 2005 baseline by 2030 interim target, and we have a zero net emissions by 2050. And then you have to look at all of your sectors, energy, transport, built environment, um, land sector, agriculture, etc., and determine where the most efficient mitigation, so economically efficient but also practical, um, where you can get those savings and, 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 and how you therefore will proceed through that process to decolonisation. Mm -hmm. and, and you were talking about the, the First Nations voices you were able to hear through Leanne Eon. What about um, migrant, migrant or immigrant groups who are here? Um, some from climate affected countries like from especially from the Pacific um, mm. do those voices come come to you not not well um, and and probably because and, and this is where we get into the the three tiers of government mm -hmm. <laughs> those those voices would generally be directed more to the Commonwealth um, and you know a classic example I think is the Torres Strait um, adaptation uh, resilience strategy fantastic piece of work done by the Torres Strait funded by the Commonwealth Government, um, the, the state government really wasn't in the room for that conversation. Mm. And, and, and while the state government was, um, is responsible for, for a lot of the funding of, of many of the activities that will have to go on, um, because they weren't in the room, they haven't taken on the, the accountability, I suppose, for those tasks. So, so 
again, it's, it's sort of this mishit where you get this misalignment of, you, you know, the, the, the interest being with the Commonwealth, but often the states are having a responsibility to act, and, and, and that is not well, well joined. Right. So we've got a bit of work to do there. Mm. Okay, good. Interesting. We've, we've just had the Prime Minister give another speech today on um, his position on climate change ahead of the G7 meeting that Caitlin was referring to. Uh, I don't think there was... I haven't had a chance to read the speech, but I don't think there was much change. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, now this was <laughs> this was originally going to be a um, a panel quite a, a couple, couple of months ago now on uh, women in climate leadership, which was uh, aligned with International Women's Day, and so it was, it was going to be a slightly different conversation. But there, there's a, there's a very specific element to 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 COP, and that is. Um, in, in the gender plan, it refers to the meaningful, the, the full, meaningful, and equal participation and leadership of women in all aspects of the F, UNFCCC process, and in national and local level, level climate policy and action. And that's vital to achieving the long-term climate goals. Now, Bianca, how how successfully do you think um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women's voices uh, coming through to policymakers? And, um, and and or any on any level of government and influencing their decisions about these sort of things. I mean, I feel that there is some improvement there, but um, the big issue we've got in many cases is a lot of our appointed leaders are, have been appointed by the government, often sort of through this patriarchal process. So you know, we're traditionally Aboriginal culture and society was predominantly matriarchal. Not all communities had matri mat matriarchal processes. But I have noticed there's a change within our community and they're starting to allow the women's voice to come forward as well because, you know, we did slip into that patriarchal kind of influence, of, you know, um, in a lot of our communities and a lot of the people sitting at the tables. Um, so I guess, you know, with that, and, and some of that sort of has to do with, um, again, thinking about... Um, I, you know, thinking well, about treaty processes again. I, I was talking about this before, and we we're talking about Minister Enoch, and you know, and and I'm fortunate enough to have a very good relationship with her, and I'm actually one of her advisors for Arts Queensland. Mm -hmm. And you know, we were formed recently that all levels of government have this tracks to treaty um, embedded into everything they do. So if we get that right, and that allows each community to be able to say how they want to do, and who are our leaders, who are our spokespeople. And, and if we look back at our traditional laws and customs and way of working and we, we return to those, um, women's voice will be elevated. Mm. Um, and, you know, we also know that women in, in Aboriginal communities run the community, they run the household, they teach the children, they do the shopping, they do everything, you know, they take over, you know, so um, we are really important in that space. Are there particular issues that are still uh, emerging because the women's voice is still emerging? I guess, you know, I mean, in some ways it's, it's about this, the disparity again, you know, we're first peoples in this country are still very, very impoverished, there's a lot of people, and I don't want to really talk from that deficit space, but, you know, that we don't have access to a, you know, affordable housing, let alone to be able to put solar on our house, on our roofs of our house, you know, we don't, they don't have the money to go and buy these metal water bottles and, and think about sustainability and everything they do. Um, so. Uh, you know, so there has to be, I guess, an opportunity for women, and again, it starts with community, and it needs to come from the community up. You know, we have too many top-down approaches, um, and then it's a lot more um, opportunities for women to be able to be involved in these community conversations, which we're not seeing. And um, I mean, there are some areas that are doing it better than others, but I know in southeast Queensland, for instance, there is not a lot of stuff happening. You know, in in this particular area. Um, you know, again, everybody always concentrates on the regional remote areas mm -hmm. and there's that sort of, um, there's almost a form of racism in that space because, you know, they say, because 70% of Indigenous Australians live in urban communities and people don't realise that, so they kind of always focus on what's happening in the Northern Territory and these other areas and, I mean, I'm not saying that, like, there's kind of parts of our country that, that people don't have water and water's a right, not a privilege you know, and, and they don't have clean water. So, I mean, I understand that the, the situation is a lot more dire than here, but, you know, our, our accessibility, we, we still have a lot of similar issues and, and issues around being able to feed our children, clothe our children, get them to school um, without thinking about, you know, the, the bottom basic 
stuff. Yeah. yeah. Maureen, um, you come from a country where there is not one single woman in parliament. Vote me then. <laughs> Sorry, no. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it must, it, in a, in a, in a, to have a country with no woman's voice in the, the, chamber, the decision making chamber of, of the nation, um, how, how, does that, how does it affect uh, decision making in a country like Papua New Guinea in terms of what happens? It is difficult, but I guess in the uh, departmental heads, they, uh, they are women leaders who are in the bureaucratic section, but they're also women veering into the non-government uh, organizations, NGOs, to try and take up their own leadership roles and to venture into business opportunities, because that's the only way forward is uh, for women to get into business opportunities in Papua New Guinea. Unfortunately, uh, hopefully, there'll be uh, the election in 2022. Uh, the United Nations Development Program has um, tried to identify some of the women leaders to try and conduct uh, programs for them to stand as politicians, which they've done in the last elections, and unfortunately, uh, the three that were in the pre previous election lost their seats and no one got in. But uh, I guess the, in the climate change space, there are voices outside of, um, of the uh, political agenda, uh, maybe mainly on the local level. I'll give an example of uh, Aripa, who comes from Popondeta. She's the representative of the, or leader of the National Council of Women. And Guba Cyclone went into happened in Oro province in 2016. Now that's where the Kokoda track is around that area. Mm -hmm. She takes um, charge of um, making sure the school continues because she has a heliconia farm that she have plants and she did say that she was having problems and not getting enough support and I guess that's where um, I can argue and say that we should have women in the roundtable conference, but uh, that table has got to get bigger with more women in it. Uh, that's not happening in the highest level of government. You know, we don't have a politician there, but uh, hopefully uh, they are doing their own little bits in the, in the grassroots level. Uh, for example, Ezra Rakova is one of the good examples doing a relocation program. And uh, in Papua New Guinea, there's a, I've forgotten her name, but in the Highlands region, um, she's one of the Greens MP who has a program going on to, uh, because of the frost came through the Highlands region. There's a whole lot of more things I could ask you about your country, um, but I'll go to Georgine. Georgine, you, you're a woman who's in a fairly high level of influence. Could well, it, is I'm that a, is that a fair... in Queensland, aren't I, with the Premier and yeah. my Minister and my Direct Force, Deputy Director General. Um, women, I think, um, and, and certainly the, the, the policy of, of the Queensland Government to have 50% of women on boards, uh, government boards, I think is a very important one. Um, um, I think because this issue sits within the Department of Environment, we, we are predominantly women. Um, my team is probably 80% women. Um, the poor blokes, um, they have asked for a, a bit of diversity. <laughs> we will improve the numbers. Um, but no, I'm, I, I have to say, I think uh, women have been attracted intellectually to um, the, the climate change challenge. Um, and I think, uh, and, and I, I don't know what the research is on this, but I, but I do, do query, um, Climate change requires systems thinking. Um, I, I, I do find that women seem to be more interested in systems approach. Um, and so therefore, I think, find the climate change topic attractive. So certainly, I don't see, um, I, you know, I used to work in the energy sector and it was very male. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the climate change sector, for, for me, it, it is not. Mm -hmm. um, but that could be simply because where I'm sitting and, and who I'm surrounded by. But um, you know, I think the, 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 the voices of women are very powerful and um, in policy and the view to trying to make that policy as inclusive as possible, uh, I, I would argue, is, is, is probably influenced by women. But, um, yeah, got a lot, lot to... I think women have a lot to offer this because of the systems, systems approach. 
Okay, well, I, there's also much more we could talk about, but I'm getting a, a tapping signal from the back of the room, which means it's time to move to the Q&A. So we don't have roving mics. We've just got a mic on either corner, mm -hmm. and you'll have, to, um, you'll have to bring yourself to stand up and go to the mic. Don't be shy. But while you're thinking about that, um, Bianca's just uh, won a commission in Dubbo, and I just thought uh, Bianca could tell us a little bit about that while you all get up and line up by the mics, please. <laughs> Hurry up, line up, please. No, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I uh, won this massive big um, 1.2 kinetic art um, installation in Dubbo, and it's, a, it's got many layers. So, it's a massive big cyanotype. If anyone's familiar with cyanotypes, it's, it's a type of photography that you use um, nature and sunlight. And I wanted to look at, you know, the idea of using grass seeds and, you know, we think about, you know, dark emu and, and the importance of, of grass seed as far as, um, again, creating sustainable environmental and agricultural processes in, in the country. And, and I was thinking about regrowth and all this kind of stuff because this is outside the old Dubbo jail, so how do we change conversations and, and, um, and change the agency of that space by creating these, you know, putting this this new growth and thinking about the new story. So the whole concept was about if these walls could talk. So I've, I've been working on this other project called Listening to Country. So we've been taking the sounds and doing sound recordings of country and then inserting them back into um, environments like the Women's Detention Centre, looking at how we heal country and, and how we heal women through the sounds of country. So there's the, the second component. So we've got this massive big artwork that houses this sound and lighting soundscape that's also been created. So through the Listening to Country project, you've then also got, um, you know, I'll be working with community to, to develop an emotional landscape at, which is based around colours of country. So I'll be taking photos of the waterways and the riverways and working with the community to look at, think about the sounds and, you know, what does the sound of the buck cockatoo, how does that make you feel? How does the sound of the kookaburra sound? And what emotionally, how does that make you feel? And, and assign colours. So then there'll be a, a, a lightscape that will be sent through an algorithm. And so, and, and we're, I'm creating that, that community can continue to interact with it and change the sounds as they go. So it'll be really interesting to sort of not only just track the, the sound data and, and looking at the how that, that creates a sensible health and well-being, but and you know, and linking it to, mm. to lighting, um, yeah, it'll it'll be quite an interesting mm. process to sort of see how we can link the two together. And I can see you were all so mesmerised <laughs> by that you couldn't get yes. yourself up <laughs> and get yourself to a microphone. But I do think we have our first question. Now we'd like to have questions, not statements. I'm not Tony Jones. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and make this. I'll, I'll reword it into a question. Okay. Um, yeah. No. Thank you, panel. It's been really great. I love hearing these discussions, particularly when they're led um, by women. Uh, my name's Sarah. I'm a PhD and um, researcher at the, with the with the Beacon, actually, based down at Gold Coast, out of the Griffith Health Science Group. Um, and in this discussion and in others. Um, I hear a lot of references to including groups like women, youth, uh, people with disability, people in poverty, etc. Uh, but even more so, you know, references to custodianship and to the connection of country of our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander uh, and Pacific Island communities. While we're including and promoting these voices and experience, what are we doing uh, or what can we do to avoid taking a position of, look, we broke it, you fix it? Wow. Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big question. Um. Yeah, that's just yeah. That's one that I just sort of need to think. <laughs> so, do you mean intergenerational, as in, so uh, I guess those who are in positions of power, sort of handing it over to those who who don't have those levers of power to some extent? Is that what you're talking about? Fix it, 
I mean, that always happens. Everybody always comes to the Aboriginal person and says, you know, we, you know, there's been a racist thing, thing in the classroom. Can you come and fix it? So, you know, that's just what happens all the time. And um, and I've started saying to people, um, please don't ask me to fix the problem. You know, you, you sort of find the solution yourself. Um, but then, but I, I do think um, if they. It's about having, actually respecting their knowledge. It's about respecting what they bring to the table and, and being meaningful in that conversation, not just kind of going, you know, you fought the war, you lost the war, get over it kind of thing. Um, it needs to be a really respectful, um, and I think reciprocation is really important. We talk about that all the time, about reciprocation and making sure that that knowledge that they're giving you is used and understood and respected but you also are giving them knowledge. You know, there's this, there's got to be this two-way relationship, and it just can't be always give, give, give. And picking up on that, with the climate strike from students, mm. the generation that is going to be living with it, mm. how much does that influence policy making? Look, I mean, I think it, it, it has had influence in, in raising the issue um, up in, in, in households at dinner tables and, and what have you. I think the intergenerational piece um, really puts pressure on. I mean, I don't know how many times I've, I've heard from people um, perhaps older than myself to talk about the how they feel about looking at their children and, and the decisions they're making. So I think that, that intergenerational pressure is, is really, really important. We do spend a lot of time, though, don't we, trying to sell the opportunity <laughs> to, to the next generation. Look at all of the things that need your help. <laughs> Um, I, I, I think I'm guilty of doing that with my own daughter. Um, but look, I, I was just mentioning before, you know, we were pretty excited last week uh, with a federal court decision, you know, bought by youth um, that, that finally has set a precedent. It, it first uh, globally in common law, uh, a precedent uh, whereby the government was held to have a duty um, to protect youth from climate change. You know, that, that's, that's an extraordinary impact. It may still be appealed, but it's, it's, it's formed the precedent that it needed to do. And so, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, the, uh, the, it's, it's the out-of-the-box out of actors who I think can have such an enormous influence. So while I agree, we don't want to hand over the problem, I, I hope, you know, that, that everyone is trying to solve this with what they've got available to them, because I think um, the, the institutional actors and, and the, the Titanic that we're on um, often doesn't move fast enough. Hmm. And Maureen, I'd like to ask you as well, because Pacific, the Pacific's particularly interesting. A lot of countries now have a population where 50% is under the age of 16. Mm. And the Pacific <coughs> Islands obviously are one of these least or um, most negligible contributors to the impacts of climate change. What's, what's, the, what's the feeling amongst young people in the Pacific? Because quite often it, it's, it's, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of strong voices coming I out. I think they are, they, they are strong. The young people are very strong because that's really their future mm. on the islands and the low-lying islands uh, witnessing the impact and so the young ones are taking up the fight to try and uh, um, be active active uh, climate change warriors mm -hmm. if you like yeah and um, for example in FamLink the weather watch it's run by a feminist youth group not run by it's staffed by a lot of young people and young women and um, so they, they are, they're training 60 other women from, young people from Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, and Papua New Guinea to have suitcase radio kits in a suitcase to try and respond to climate change and weather patterns. And they're trying to include everyone, not just women, but elderly, the sick, the LGTB community, and the old, and all that. So. Yeah. Okay, um, next question over here, please. Thank you. Sorry, I don't know if I can follow up that question. Yeah. <laughs> um, but oh, sorry, could you just say your name as well? Oh, sorry, yeah. I'm Caitlin. Um, I previously studied here at Griffith, uh, doing my Masters of Marketing and hoping to pursue my PhD in Marketing for Social Change, um, mm -hmm. particularly in Climate Change, which is why I'm here tonight. But there's been a lot of talk about having the right people in the room for the conversations and that being in the room is part of what makes them accountable. And I think that's great because these 
uh, communities and voices that are maybe not heard and are so willing to be a part of the conversation are being involved. But how do you make sure that those voices are heard by maybe people from industries or organizations who are reluctant to be a part of the conversation because maybe their actions are contributing neg negatively towards climate change? But if they heard those voices, they could these are the people who could really make the biggest impact by changing their actions. So how do you bring those kind of two groups together? I guess like we're really focusing on bringing people who are willing to be a part of the conversation into it, but what about those people who can make a difference but are reluctant? Well, maybe Bianca can ask you, have you done any art commissions for corporations that mightn't, mightn't be particularly uh, climate friendly? And have you been able to communicate to them in the process? I have, oh, met gosh, that I think in 20 years ago, I was actually asked to have my work used as a, for a, an anti-nuclear campaign, mm -hmm. um, and you know, I had to, I actually had to tread very carefully because at the time, my father was actually one of those people that were helping pollute the planet, um, and you know, so I had to take, you know, so uh, yeah, but but I I have been. So I was in a recent situation where I was actually asked by Rio Tinto to judge an art prize and they were, you know, flying me there and, and I actually felt, you know, really uncomfortable with the whole thing, you know, um, and, and they, you know, and this was in Western Australia and, and they do have such a big presence and it's the biggest, highest paying Indigenous Art Award in the country or through Rio Tinto. So it's really, um, you know, problematic and, and the community love it and it's, and, but I, you know, for me it didn't sit well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, sometimes we get really conflicted in what we do. Um, but I also had to go off with, with this, you know, the nuclear one. I have to keep my nose clean because if they know that my dad's working in the mining industry, um, you know, oh, yeah. I'm, yeah. So, so were you able to open a channel of communication with Rio Tinto on any of the many issues that is afflicting them at the moment? I had this awkward moment where they go, you need to go on the mine tour if you, get to go, if you want to go see the art centre. And I was like, oh, no. no. And yeah, it was actually, you know, yeah, it, it made me actually, it actually gave me really real insight about how actual communities are let, told, oh, you know, they'll, they'll move in this, this mine and they'll bring all this income and money. And it's the lies that they tell. You know, they tell these big lies and say, you know, well, we're going to create all these jobs and then you go in there and they're the mine of the future and it's all automated. You know, they keep, they have like 20 weeks of work setting up a mine, then everybody's shuffled out of town and then, you know, so it's, it is a really, you know, problematic um, thing where communities are, and then it causes fights and they have title fights across people because they want this mine to come back. I mean, you know, Adani's been a really good example of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and how it's divided communities because of the the fact that they've been lied to around. Oh, you know, we're going to give you all this money and all these jobs, and you'll get all this kickback, you know, from, from cultural heritage, and it's not worth the money. You know, it's not worth destroying the planet. Georgie, um, in terms of um, look, I'm not sure. There's, you know, I, I think people have to come willingly to a conversation. Um, I think I would look to. Um, you know, one of the the big developments um, has been with uh, sustainable finance. Sustainable finance is is where you say that the, the money that you invest can't ultimately hurt the people who are meant to be the beneficiaries of that money, if, if that makes sense. So, if you think of your superannuation, um, you know that that superannuation fund. Um, can't invest in things that ultimately are going to m make your life miserable um, because it's, of course, meant to be for your economic future. Yeah, so I think the role of sustainable finance is critical in this. Um, and so when, when money says that I will, be, I will only be applied and only invested in things that are good for our collective good and the, and the, the benefit of the individual, I think that's when you'll start you know, to flick the switch. I, I suspect that you can't take companies who don't see the, the benefit of, of those conversations and of their role in society and in community as, as, as an entity that is meant to benefit the broader community. I'm not sure that, that money talks. Yeah. Let's just say that. So, so Georgine, under Australian law, co companies have to make a profit for their shareholders. 
That's the that's their their fundamental rationale for them existing. Yeah. So when when you have those sort of conversations, is it how hard is it to to communicate this message to them when they when they say, well, our job is to make money for our shareholders? Look, I think that conversation is changing very much in boardrooms. Um, you know, I, I I think well, certainly climate risk is now considered a foreseeable risk. So as a as a director on a company today in Australia you will be um, held accountable, you will be liable if you are not taking climate risk into account under most areas of law in in Australia at the moment. Um, Bringing and building the the capability of directors in Australia up to understand that is another issue entirely. Um, But you really do have um, companies like BHP who are really sort of setting the benchmark on reconsidering what um, the fundamental value to their shareholders is and it it is way more than profit. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think that will start to come through. I mean, we heard, I heard, I think it was last week now, um, an executive board director from ENI, which is an Italian um, oil and gas company. Um, they are just in the process of totally remaking their company. So then they will be an energy company of the future. And it was fascinating hearing the role of the board in that, you know, remuneration, um, health, safety and environment, risk, the risk committee. Every committee on that, that board had a role to play. And they've just released their first um, uh, sustainable uh, finance bond, I think the first in, in Europe of its kind. So the, the private sector and its governance has a massive role to play in this. And, and I think that's developing. Now, E and I took to the World Economic Forum an initiative uh, for something called, um, I think Chapter Zero it's called, which is a huge initiative to, uh, and, the, and they're, they're doing a deal with the AICD, you'd be happy to know, so that you know, the, the education of our boards will commence and, and that's really, really important in this space. Okay. Mm. Sir, you have a question. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much to the panel. It's been a wonderful event so far. Uh, I'm probably in no fit state to be asking questions. Could you introduce yourself? I was, yes, I was about to do that because <laughs> I was writing course profiles all day so, <laughs> um, to provide wonderful educational experiences for our students, Vice Chancellor. Uh, my name is Samit Suleiman. I'm a lecturer um, at the university. Um, I've I've been studying COP for a little while. Um, and I just want to bring us back to the title of the of the um, of the, the session, the road to COP. Um, I think COP there's somewhat what of a representational bottleneck um, at the conference of parties, right? Where we have all these diverse voices finding us a place and an audience mm-hmm. within the broader you know UNFCCC process within the UN system, but ultimately the UNFCCC conference of parties is about the parties, right? So. Stripping away everything, it's about what happens in the negotiating rooms. Mm. So I'm just wondering, given that we've heard so many diverse perspectives that aren't necessarily represented in global climate negotiations, how do we best project these important perspectives into these really important spaces of multilateral collaboration and cooperation? Thank you. Wow, that's a PhD. (laughs) Thanks, Samid. (laughs) <laughs> well, one, one voice that's come through very strongly in the whole climate, uh, international climate discussion is, has come from the Pacific yeah, and has come from particularly from Fiji mm. um, and PNG hasn't quite taken that sort of voice. But Maureen, what, why do you think the Pacific's been so good at projecting its voice through? They don't want to drown. They're fighting. I <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's right. They the the platform is burning. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Is is that what you mean? So I mean, how how, how do these sec- sectional voices get well, through? Well, in West New Britain province, um, the community stood up against a mining firm trying to introduce seabed mining, mm. and they've successfully stopped the platform for the time being. But mm. the one in Medang is still going on. I think it was that visceral nature of the lived experience Mm. and that I think Fiji uh, have been so proactive in starting to manage the just uh, extraordinary uh, challenges of of rehousing and and, uh, that conversation around culture and and how you make sure everyone is going to be okay. Mm. Um, I don't think anyone can deny the, the, the power of that. Um, and, and 
and I think they made an extraordinary effort um, in their representations globally. I mean, I think they really did a good job of it, yeah. um, which, which was terrific. A and were clearly um, assisted in funding to do that, which is also really important. Yeah. There's no point asking somebody to have a voice and them having no resources to be able to do it. Which we so, saw from yeah. Kiribati as well, yeah. with the Notre Dame. Yeah. 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 Uh, Bianca, uh, with, in terms of the First Nations voice in this discussion, how, how successful is it penetrating through, say, to this federal government, which has to go, or which is going to Glasgow, and um, getting, we, we have, we've seen the Uluru Statement from the Heart, how, um, how well that's been taken yes. up. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I, again, I think it, some of it also comes back to the government boards, mm. and you know, what you were saying before, and, and the importance of, of there being First Nations people on every, I said, I believe, I've always said it's about having a seat at the table. We, all, we need to be always making sure that there's a seat at the table. And, and if you can get the right people on these government boards, um, I think that helps bring the voice up. You know, they, they're all, you know, all these governments are doing raps now and they're doing, um, you know, have advisory committees. And they've got to make sure that the advisory committees are, committees are also actually empowered to have a voice and to be able to action things. Um, and that there's leadership in that space and that a lot of the, 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 the principles of the way companies and, and organisations, institutions run are very much based around, you know, Indigenous-led principles. And I think that would sort of help some of that under, underlying, um, you know, yeah. I mean, especially with this, the big corporations, they do, you know, people listen to them. Mm. You know, and you see with the government, you know, a lot of our stuff, particularly when we think about Adani, you know, there was this to and froing with Adani. And it became, a, a, you know, a very much a political tool. And, and the government's always about, you know, the carbon, when they're talking about the carbon tax, it was about these big government paying blood money, basically, you know. And, and if you can get first peoples in these rooms, I, mean, I know Rio Tinto just appointed a um, first person as to be on their board as a director. So small steps, but, you know, hopefully that's, you know, that sort of stuff's important because they listen to these big corporations. So it's not just about the government, but it's also about these big corporations. And what, what about representation in Parliament? We've got more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Parliament than we've ever had before in Australia. Yeah. Uh, are, are, there, are there voices like Ken Wyatt federally? Um, we've got Cynthia Louie, the first uh, Torres Strait Islander woman in, in any parliament yeah. here in Queensland. We're getting more of those voices in. Are they, do you feel like they are getting some traction? Yes, yeah, in some, in some cases. But I do think we need to have a... I, I'm all for a black woman prime minister. Yes, <laughs> yes. Are we voting for you? Are you tipping anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Give me your hand. Minister Enoch. <laughs> <laughs> OK, next question, please. Uh, hi, my name is Melissa Jackson. Um, I'm from Griffith University on the Gold Coast, and working with the Climate Action Beacon. And my research has been around looking at collaboration for um, working with remote Indigenous communities on climate change, on sustainable water and communities. Uh, and one of the big barriers that has come up is around this idea of dialogue and, and collaboration. And so. I was wondering if you could just reflect on the role of uh, both women and, I guess, uh, cross-cultural dialogue in supporting this um, conversation we need to have about these complex issues across society. Because we know that um, often in the media and in government, it's a very adversarial conversation that happens. And uh, we uh, tend to encourage people to pick sides. And once you're on one side, you have to oppose that. So, uh, one of the lessons we know is that dialogue is really important. So if you could reflect on bringing women, um, in, you, you talked about women maybe being more conducive to systems thinking, so I think there's a connection there as well, but also, um, I guess, marginalised voices and, and uh, different cross-cultural conversations, how that can be support, supported through dialogue. Thank you. I'd like to go to Maureen again because um, in the Pacific, it's very different in terms of how uh, how communication happens and and women's groups and men's groups and there's a, there's a huge network I've noticed through my work in the Pacific between women across the Pacific, which doesn't seem to be the same sort of network that the male leaders have and the, and the male um, workers within NGOs and things like that. Why, why is there this really strong connection with women across the region and this really strong communication? 
I guess maybe because women are left behind, so that's why they decided to run forward. <laughs> that's my, uh, and um, although the, there's lack of leadership in a political level, I guess the traditional level, some parts of, uh, I'll go back to Papua New Guinea, a matrimonial society, women own land, so women try and uh, take up the leadership role there. And uh, in some parts, women are not uh, in the, women don't own land, but they still, because of other social issues of uh, DV or, and then they come out of it and try and uh, take up leadership role to, uh, I've lost my thought of train, lost my That's right. train of thought, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's about how, how different con how conversations are, are, are managed differently, or so it's not an adversarial, but a, a more collegial way of approaching the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I guess the idea of dialogue, where there's a, a strong listening component as, as well as not just uh, talking about the Um, there, there are some strong women feminist groups in, in the region that uh, go together and share safe space. Like, for example, I'll go back to the Fijian uh, Weather Center. Um, there's, they try and involve all women, and majority of the women have gone into being representation, represented in the disaster committees from different levels as well. So that's a very strong Fijian example. Whereas Papua New Guinea, in terms of climate change, I guess it is a bit difficult because the men are the uh, breadwinners of the family, although the women are supposed to be the nurturers and that. But uh, some parts, as I said, do, um, they do involve uh, women talking amongst themselves to try and work, but sometimes women don't really support each other as well in some cases. So that's another issue altogether, and uh, which is, I don't <laughs> want to dwell into that. <laughs> Georgine, how would you like? Uh, look, I think, um, I think it's, a, it's essential. Um, are we any good at it um, is, is probably a separate issue. Um, I was having a conversation before I came in with a woman who works with me, Kirsten Lovejoy, who leads a lot of our um, conversation with First Nations. And she has for many, many years. And, you know, I was sort of asking her that question as to, you know, why, why we can't kind of get this conversation right. She talked a lot about um, the sense that communities have of being terribly over-consulted. They are consultation fatigued. Um, we turn up to have a conversation about almost anything. We don't coordinate those conversations. We don't pay for people's time. Um, and, and so, you know, it, and what that, you know, people start losing a sense of wanting to participate. Um, so I think, unfortunately, climate change um, for many of these communities, I think, is, is, is the latest issue on top of a great mound of issues that, that, that haven't been resolved. We're not talking about resilient communities who are sitting there only thinking about this issue. Um, and so I think while we would love to be involved in that um, conversation and process, I, I think it, it ignores some systemic and fundamental issues that, that sit underneath it. So uh, where I can probably talk about where that has been more successful is in um, more broadly in place-based policy. So when we go to place and talk to a broad community in place about um, you know, what their values are as a community, how they feel in light of the science and the information that's given to them, how resilient they feel uh, in, in the face of that and what they think their successful path towards those challenges looks like. Uh, when you can facilitate that dialogue, and that is not a quick dialogue, that is a very long dialogue, and it's a very expensive dialogue to facilitate and pay for, um, I think you can get a really amazing uh, outcome. Um, 
So Queensland has done that uh, with, with six communities so far um, with a pretty big price tag. Um, one of the issues I think is that you start to e exhaust the budget of governments to be able to fac facilitate those conversations. That's not to say they're not required. So, so how do we collectively, um, using the anchor institutions that we have in, in place and other community actors to, to really bring these conversations forward? Um, but I think conversation is essential. Um, recently, we, well, I participated in one in Gladstone, which was, um, the, the GOCs funded it, but it was led by um, a, co a consultancy who, who specialises in um, moderating community conversation, and it brought together all actors involved in Gladstone in the energy sector there to talk about what a new energy future looks like. That's a fundamental conversation. Um, it, it had some a few sharp edges on it um, and some interesting um, outcomes, but the conversation was critical and will lead to other things. So yes, I, I couldn't agree more. I think the more of those we have, the better. And we're coming close to running out of time for this section. Um, did you have a question? Yes. I have two. Do I need to pick one? <laughs> okay, <more>? you go. <laughs> um, okay, I have two questions. Sorry, I'm Harriet Scandal. I'm from the British High Commission, so it's naughty of me to be stealing a spot um, asking a question when I could have just asked them all previously. but. Anyway, um, <laughs> they kind of came up from the conversation. Um, so the first question I have is is related to the previous gentleman's question, and it's about. Um, I mean, the the pessimist in me says that it's going to take a while until we have you know um, decision making bodies that are adequately representative of the the society that we actually live in. Mm -hmm. So in the interim, while we're on a journey of of making that happen, how do we sort of shut the gap between? The, the vulnerabilities of people who are most, um, most acutely vulnerable to climate change. So people living in poverty, women, you know, indigenous communities, people in the Pacific Islands and so on. You know, particularly people, you know, when you look at it from a sort of intersectional perspective who suffer from you know, multiple of those vulnerabilities as well. The, the difference between the profiles of those most vulnerable people and the people who are making the decisions. Um, in the interim, how do we make the people who are making those decisions and whether that's, you know, at the multilateral level, whether it's federal governments, whether it's state governments, etc., how do we actually make them care? How do we make them adopt a, a, a way of thinking that actually considers those people's vulnerabilities as well? Here's my first question. <laughs> <laughs> my second question, sorry, um, is about, um, I might have forgotten it. Um, oh, it's about um, the communication and sort of place-based policy question. And this might um, also get me in trouble for work because it seems to completely go against the principles of, of COP and what international sort of multilateral climate policy is trying to achieve. But if there's a general consensus that sort of place-based local policy is going to be more effective and more inclusive and making you know, policies that are appropriate for the people that need them, how do we feed place-based policy principles into international uh, climate frameworks like the UNFCCC and like COP26? How do we stop trying to tell everyone what to do from the bottom and make sure that we give everyone space to make policies from the bottom up that are right for them? Thank you. Sorry. Could I, <laughs> could I, dis <laughs> could I distill that just a little bit? I was, I was thinking while you were talking, and I'd like to turn to Bianca because um, we're on, on land that was never ceded and uh, there is no treaty here and the history wars that have gone on and, and the disregard that's been shown for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. How important is it for a government to have a relationship with Indigenous people on an equal footing and for those sort of issues then to be right at the top of the, the agenda? And it comes back to that place-based policy. That's really about acknowledging Indigenous processes. You know, we weren't just one big country, you know, there was 247 or, you know, odd nations, different language groups, and everybody had their own independent law system and culture system and, and ways of working and, and governance. So I think that it doesn't make sense to have a one-size-fits-all approach to, to everything. So I, and I think if you want to bring communities on board, you've actually got to realise that the, the realities of, of that individual community and what they what the restraints are, what the you know, what, what and making sure that they're resourced and everything they need to do. So I think that that was, you know, for me to remember that we were never one you know, we were one mob in, in a way but not one mm. as in the in the way, you know, we were never Australia. We were Kabi Kabi, we were Wanjiri, we were Gumilaroi, you know, all these different people and then little groups within that. Mm. Yeah. So would would something like a some some sort of a 
um, ruler or stone from the heart or a well, treaty? Would that would that bring your voice a little bit further into the into the centre of decision making that would allow it to be transmitted into look, an international forum? We're not going to get anywhere in this country until there's some form of treaty made. I mean, you know, because native title doesn't work. We're trying it. It doesn't work. It divides and conquers. It causes actual. Um, in fact, you know, again, talking to the community, mm. they said our, grave, our cemeteries were empty before native title were filled too, and, you know, in this short 20-year process that they were trying to go through native title. So um, native title kills people. It just divides and conquers. It's, it was never set up, to, set up to actually work and benefit communities. And when you look at the native title, you actually don't get much. As an Aboriginal person, you, you don't get many rights. So treaty, and each treaty needs to be negotiated with each community. Yes, it's a huge job. Imagine the government trying to negotiate when, when we can't even negotiate within our own family groups. Uh, you know, and we talk about reconciliation and we have those Aboriginal people reconciled within our community. So, you know, there's, there's a whole heap of other deep complex issues that need mm. to be resolved. And then as we're talking about, when you talk about climate change and you're talking to community and talking to these young ones, a lot of these young ones are struggling with the future as it is, and it scares the crap out of them, you know, because our law was you would had to think 10 generations in front, and that's broken down, that whole system's broken down, and, and, our, and this is where native title doesn't help, because you've got, you know, people are thinking about the money that's going in their pocket, and they're not thinking about the next generation. Not everyone's in that way, but, you know, there are people in there for the right reasons. Um, and then, you know, it leads to our huge suicide problem, you know. I mean, we can't talk about climate change when we're actually trying to keep our kids alive. Mm. You know, this, that's the reality. And But these depressing, deep, dark conversations we're having about our future and our kids' futures, it doesn't, you know, help them feel good and that there's, you know, promise and, and hope at the end of it all. Thanks, Pete. Yeah. Last question over here. Good evening. Um, my name Just is come Ruth. a little bit closer to the microphone. <laughs> um, my name is Ruth and I'm from Kiribati. I'm doing law and international relation at Bond University. Uh, first of all, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. And uh, my question is, um, do you think there would be a benefit to pursuing policies that seek to teach our leaders cultural competency? Or if these educational initiatives have already exist, and if they include an element of climate change? So you're saying that the, the leaders need to have a better understanding? Yeah, um, yeah uh, if there are policies that exist that... Yeah. For, and are you talking about for countries like Kiribati or...? Yes. Yeah. Um, Maureen, I think you might be, that might be one for you to start with because how, how much do the, the leaders of Papua New Guinea actually, um, or the current leader, comprehend about the issues of climate change, especially with the diversity of the of your country where you have um, peaks where you almost get snow and you have tropical beaches? Our leaders don't really give a damn about the climate change, I think. Sorry my language, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. In PNG? In PNG, yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, there are the leaders like Anington yeah. and uh, Fijian Prime, Prime Minister, they've argued on climate change and um, and how it's affecting the region. But I guess something that needs to be understood is Pacific Islands is very diverse. The islands mm. is very massive. And um, you can't just under take one particular area and say it's the same for all Pacific mm. region. Even in Papua New Guinea alone, it has 850 different languages. And uh, trying to understand climate change in the coast is di different to the one up in the highlands, to the inland, to low-lying lands. So it's uh, difficult. And uh, I guess um, when people's actual homeland is sinking, then they'll react to mm -hmm. it. I'd like to go on, but I've been given the... Um, <laughs> The ultimate wind-up, not quite, but <laughs> it could be close to a death step. Look, um, <laughs> well, um, could you please uh, all say thank you to our wonderful panellists. <laughs> and back over to Caitlin Byrne.
Um, and actually, if I can invite our panellists to return to their seats and invite my colleague, Professor Sue Harris-Rimmer, to the podium. Uh, Sue is the Director of the Policy Innovation Hub here at Griffith University and leading our climate justice program of research and engagement within the Beacon to deliver the vote of thanks. Over to you, Sue. I have the wonderful duty of giving a vote of thanks to our exceptional panel and all of you who asked such insightful questions, especially Ruth. I'm so excited because Tess and I mentor Ruth and we're very proud of her for coming and asking that question, standing up for all the wonderful women of Kiribati. Um, we have really needed these types of conversations and part of our job here at Griffith University is to amplify voices and to try to bring some of these issues into these international spaces. And that is the point of the Climate Action Beacon. So we were so thrilled to partner with the UK Commission, High Commission in Australia. We are going to urge you all to really drink in what our amazing speakers have told us and to use your power to engage with DFAT, for example, who are running a consultation process on COP26. You can email our lovely friends at DFAT um, and I will be emailing a, a report of this meeting to our colleagues there, and so can you. Any of these issues can be raised uh, with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and that's one way we can elevate our issues and elevate our voices. And there's also other things you can do. You can join in, in supporting organisations whose diverse voices you've heard. So you can join the Pacific Island Council of Queensland, and Griffith's very proud to support some of the events that are coming up uh, later in the year in, uh, again, bringing this Pacific diaspora voice to the forefront in the lead up to COP26. You can f listen, learn, um, hear the voices, get involved in those types of events. You can, um, for example, I follow Seed Mob, which are a young Indigenous ad activist organisation, uh, the leader of whom is here in Queensland. You can support activists. Um, just you know, we, we can have a duty, I think, to listen and learn and grow in our own thinking. And that's something that we can all do here today. Um, and you can get involved. There's a whole heap of wonderful things coming up. There's the Sustainability and Science Showcase. That's exciting. Just the sound of it, isn't it? Um, on Sunday, it's a free event with the Queensland Museum uh, where we will be listening to the chief scientist um, help us all uh, in our quest to um, uh, progress towards the Sustainable Development Goal 13 on climate action. Uh, you can join me in the afternoon to see how Australia is going around the SDGs and what you can do to promote the SDGs. You can go and visit our beautiful Australian Rivers Institute stall. You can please take one of these and forward it to your friends that live in rural and remote Queensland and tell them we are coming because we want to listen to them. So we've just come back from Charleville and we're about to have a stall at the Mount Isa show um, talking about climate justice. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> we're going everywhere. Um, and uh, you can also take part in some difficult conversations about climate justice that we'll, Griffith is holding in um, partnership with Adderton House. Uh, at the end of the year and 1st of November. So all these resources are out there. You can read all those wonderful reports on the road to COP that are coming out of the Griffith Asia Institute. So there's, there's sort of um, many different ways that we can listen to the counter narrative, I, I like to think of it, or the counterfactual about ways people are experiencing climate change from the, the bottom of the well is the way I think of it. So we all have that responsibility and duty to, to be listening with our ears open. Um, and we do have the opportunity through the place we have in the world to raise these issues to the international level. So uh, these voices that we've heard today, these important voices for Maureen, Georgine and Bianca, um, they can be spread around the world and that's all of our responsibilities. I want to say Maureen, um, so fascinated to hear you say the women were left behind, so they ran forward. It was beautiful. And we really respect the work you do in radio and the work you do in promoting constantly women's voices from Papua New Guinea. We are very grateful to have you here tonight and we're delighted in listening to you. Um, Georgine, you've got the hardest job in the world, but we really respect. Georgine is an associate uh, with uh, Griffith working on the Climate Action Beacon in her many jobs. 
And you, what you see is a really brilliant policy mind struggling with some really difficult issues and um, so frank and so honest about the challenges that the government's facing in this space. We're really grateful to hear your insights tonight and I think it's given us a lot of insight into this idea of the totality of the policy problems confronting the Queensland government, for example. Bianca, I'm so delighted that you are, I'm from Coonabarabra in New South Wales, very close to Dubbo. Um, I can't believe you're going to transform Central West with this beautiful art piece. I'm absolutely delighted. And I love what you say about this idea of the point is to respect and reciprocate First Nations voices in these debates. Um, it was a very beautiful insight and we're really grateful uh, that your creative practice is constantly helping us rethink and reframe the way we think about climate issues and environmental issues. We are so delighted with your amazing leadership role as the Director of the Indigenous Research Unit in Griffith. You've made such a contribution already and uh, this is this great example of the kind of leadership that our First Nations women are making in our own university. So thank you. We are deeply grateful for your insights. Stefan, I've always been a massive fan of yours. Stefan has been a voice for social justice and human rights in Australia for as long as I can remember, um, and tireless in bringing forward the voice of Pacific Islanders uh, in particular. And I love your advocacy on behalf of the Torres Strait people in, in particular. So you were a perfect person to provide us some gender balance here today. <laughs> and we know that you're very linked in as a journalist, both you and Maureen, with the way we communicate and think about climate change. So I would like you to all join with me in thanking this amazing panel for their insights tonight. between bodies, land and 